Good morning. Welcome to Salado Church of Christ. I already see we've got some visitors with us, and that's so wonderful. I'd like for everybody in the South Auditorium to move over to the center. And We're a little sparse, but it's so good to see each one of you. Let's start our singing this morning with sunlight. I've wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. Sunlight of his love within. The clouds may gather in the sky and billows round me roll. However dark the world may be, a sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the same found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. Soon I shall see him as he is, the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of his face all through eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the services this morning, our worship service, and uh, especially those who are visiting. We do have some visitors this morning, and we're happy that you are here with us. Uh, if you are visiting, please fill out one of the cards in the pew in front of you, or you can do the QR code that's on page two of the bulletin. A lot quicker and easier if you choose to do it that way, but uh, either way, we'd like to have a record of your attendance here with us this morning. Uh, if you're looking for a church home, we hope you will consider this congregation. A uh, great group of folks, uh, but most of all, we're, we're here to worship the Lord this morning and to worship Him not only in song, but in prayer and praise. I wanted to start with uh, <clears throat> scriptures out of uh, Psalms 95 uh, to start the service off this morning. <clears throat> oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. And you left your room this morning. Did you think to pray in the name of Christ our Savior? Did you soup our loving prayer? Oh. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, for our food, our clothing, our shelter, our health, our church family, and the freedom to worship you as the New Testament teaches us to do. What a privilege it is for us to be your children and to come to you in prayer anywhere, at any time, day or night with our requests. Father, our land is very dry. Please send rain so that the drought will end and so crops and livestock can be saved. Father, we have several members who experience severe physical pain and others who are dealing with various medical issues. We pray your comforting and healing hand will be upon them. Please bless Joe, Ray Don, and Alan and their families and their full-time work for the Lord. And we ask your blessings also upon the elders, the deacons, and the Bible class teachers. And help each one of us to use whatever talents and resources you have given us to reach others, to, to reach out to others to tell them about Jesus. Thank you for our military personnel and first responders who serve on a daily basis. Thank you most of all for Jesus, who paid the price to redeem us from our sins. Help us grow in faith and to be more like him each day. Father, we pray your name will be glorified by everything we say and do here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I guess as Joe would confirm, many times when you're thinking about 
what to say to the congregation, you end up kind of preaching to yourself. Uh, you know, you're, you, you're the one that, that maybe needs this as much as anyone, and, and, and I, I feel that way sometimes too. Uh, this is a time that we've set aside specifically to remember Christ's sacrifice and his atoning blood. And he loved us while we were yet sinners. I think when we were first baptized, we certainly understand that maybe more than we do now. Certainly, uh, it can, with the passage of time, you become successful at adopting a Christian lifestyle. You start to become a better person. It, it's easy, I think, to lose sight of this continued need for forgiveness. We view ourselves as maybe basically good, and we don't really have that, maybe feel that same need for forgiveness that we did when we were first baptized. And I, you know, this is man's wisdom. The purity of God is so far above our capabilities that, uh, well, the law illustrated that. Nobody was able to live righteously. And what you have to remember is that with that level of expectation and need to be able to go before God, um, it's hard to get there without Jesus. Matter of fact, it's impossible. We know that one day heaven's door will be shut. And how will you brag that I got there just before it shut? I did a lot better than these other guys, you know. You're still stuck with them all. You failed to make it, you know. And so what will it profit you if you almost get to heaven? I think we can take a lesson from Luke. Now, no, we, we love to pick on the Pharisees, you know. Uh, but you've got to realize each one of us has a lot of that in us. And as I read these passages, think about your own life and how are you viewing your behavior and your attitude. Are you indeed a lot like this Pharisee? Maybe not the specific things he said, but you can substitute in there. This comes out of Luke 18, 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let us not be like the Pharisee, having confidence in our life, having confidence that we're so much better than all the sin that we see around us, but we still, still need to remember that we need forgiveness because we still fall short. And we need that forgiveness that Jesus provided to one day be able to live with God forever. Shall we pray? Dearest Father, we thank you so much for the love that Jesus has extended to us. We thank you for a plan that saw our failings and provided a way for us to one day be justified before you. We thank you that Jesus loved us even though we were in many ways not lovable. And he loved us so much that he was willing to live on this earth, to suffer the pain and the difficulties that we have, yet live a perfect life. And despite doing that, he was willing to give up that life for all of our sins. As we partake of this bread representing his broken body, help us to remember that and to appreciate it and to give him all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray.
you know, sinned very hard to erase it. I think of um, some things I have. I've got a couple of shirts that got something on them. Tried to get that out. Mostly looks pretty good. You don't see marinara there anymore, but there's still there's still there's still a stain there. There's still something that you can see. You know, and, and that's the same with, with sin now. You know, you can sin against your brother or sister and you can repent of that and, and they can forgive you, but you know, there's still a residual there. There's still a hurt. You never quite get past that. The beauty and the miracle of Jesus and his blood and his atonement, though, is that it washes you completely clean. It removes not just the visible sign, but all residual of that stain as if it had never happened at all. And for this, we really need to be thankful because we have a lot of stains that need removing. Shall we pray? Dearest Father, we again thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death, as horrible as it might be, but his death and his blood that washes us clean completely and absolutely removes all traces of our sin. As we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that innocent shed blood that cleanses us, help us to be fully appreciative of it and recognize our need for it. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, as an American, maybe perhaps even more so as a Texan, we pride ourselves on our accomplishments, on our ability to work hard, our ability to produce and do things. 
And sometimes that can cause us to be pretty self-inflated. Sorry to say. Uh, but, you know, there's a missing ingredient in that. There are others who work hard, but they don't have the same benefits. These benefits spring from God. He has blessed us. We've had a part to play in that, surely. But without His blessings, all that we do would come to naught. This is a time that we have set aside to remember that and to thank God for giving us all those many things He has given us, sometimes partly due to our abilities, but sometimes just unwarranted. We could have lived in many places. We could have been born in many places. We could have worked just as hard and we could still be suffering from material want. This is a time that we can give a portion of those blessings God has given us to this congregation, this church, and to fulfill and to further God's work in this community and all around us. Let us give thanks. Dearest Father, we thank you so very much for seeing that we are without true needs and true wants, but have all of those things fulfilled and much beyond. We thank you for these, and we pray that our small token of return to you can help show how much we appreciate that and that the money would be used for good works here in this place. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus alone, trusting confidence.
I'll be reading this morning from Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Thank you for putting that slide up. Going to forget this this morning. Our children can go across the road with some guidance, and I would like the rest of us to stand. It's a little bit, a little bit sparse here, but we're not like a ship that's too one-sided uh, or the other, so it's good. We welcome each and every one that can be with us and can be with us at a distance through technology, and um, we uh, hope and pray you find a blessing by being having been here in our worship today. I am going to return this morning to a series that started several weeks ago, in which we're looking at some. I'm calling it lies and dumb sayings that we'd like to believe. Uh, lies are about God, uh, some of these. And we looked at the lie about God uh, several weeks ago. And now we turn to a saying that's it's well-intentioned by some, but it's um, maybe by some. And I'm being generous with that. But it's taken from a verse of Scripture that's often misused and abused and taken out of context and uh, leading to a dangerously wrong conclusion on an issue about which Jesus had quite a bit to say, and in fact expected us to do the opposite of what you see in the expression here at the bottom of this slide. Well, Christians shouldn't judge. That's the, that's the saying uh, that we're talking about this morning. Of course, the text that is very often misused along these very lines you may suspect already that you know where it is. Now, here's the funny thing. A lot of people will say to you, well, 
you shouldn't judge, and they know that that's a scripture, but they don't know where it is. They really can't tell you where that comes from. Well, it's from Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Depending on your translation, the one from which I read this morning is, Judge not that you be not judged. This is the old NIV. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now you're thinking, some of you are, how can I argue, how can I, your preacher, argue against the expression, well, Christians shouldn't judge, when we just heard Jesus tell his disciples and the wider audience of his Sermon on the Mount, judge not. Well, the thing that makes the difference between what people claim by that statement, you can't do that, and what Jesus meant, sort of shows up in the Greek language uh, used in 7a and 7b. Okay, uh, uh, 7-1, I should say, 7-1. There's two parts to that verse. Judge not, and that you be not judged. Two different context of judging there and the first one um, and this does seem to be involving the one way in which certainly we as human beings are not allowed to judge regardless of whether we're Christians or not verse 1a is speaking in the Greek of judgment which people pass on the lives and actions of their fellow men I'm I'm getting this straight from the Bauer uh, uh, lexicon Greek lexicon well Part B there, verse 1, the judged, that refers to that which is, this is a quote, exercised by the divine tribunal occupied by God or Christ. Put it another way, Jesus is saying here, if we're judging a fellow human being without any mercy, without any allowing him any slack, any grace, if it's extremely prejudicial, if it's entirely hypocritical, in other words, not seeing what, what's wrong in our own lives as we judge harshly, then that kind of judging is going to put us squarely in the sights of that divine tribunal of God and Christ. And I guarantee you, that is not a place in which we want to be placed. Okay? We do not want to find ourselves in that position before that tribunal. Can we agree on that? Now, so it is a fact that that kind of judging truly is prohibited, whether you're a Christian or not. As the Lord's brother James would later remind in chapter 2 of his letter, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And I have to wonder... I'm going to stay on this one exception here for a few moments this morning. I have to wonder, though I'm not sure about the, and I didn't consult a harmony of the Gospels to get the exact order in which this happened, what Jesus said here in his sermon, and what happened in the latter verses of John chapter 7 and early verses of John chapter 8. Uh, but I have to wonder if the silly picture of verses 3 through five that illustrates this hypocritical kind of judging Jesus is condemning, I wonder if he might have been thinking of what happened with the episode of the sinful woman, as we call it, who was allegedly caught in adultery. Now here's the uh, uh, here's the silly picture, and I'm sorry if you can't read that uh, print. I hope that you can. Hope that you can read that, but that's the one where someone has a two by four sticking out of their eye and they're trying to help someone remove the speck from their eye. They're, they're perfectly able to find the what's wrong and judge someone else. They just can't see their own what needs judging in their own lives. So I'll let you read that, continue to read that as you as I remind you, that Jesus was teaching one day in the public square, right in the heart of Jerusalem, when these Pharisees, and we don't know, and sorry, Keith, I, I am going to pick on Pharisees for just a moment, just a few of them. 
I know he mentioned that this morning, so uh, we do pick on them a lot. But this particular group, I think, deserves to be picked on a little bit. And we don't know how many there were. There could have been eight or ten for all we know. We don't know how they found this woman in this adulterous, supposedly, liaison. I've always had more questions about this episode than I have answers, okay? Uh, this, again, is in the latter verses of John 7, early verses of John 8, if you, if you look this up later. My question is, were they peeping toms? You know, were they, I'm serious, were they going around looking in people's windows? How do they know? Even closer to, to the truth might be, was one of the men, was one of these Pharisees, the guilty party, the other guilty party? Okay, it's likely, it's, it's entirely possible. I shouldn't say it's likely, it's entirely possible that could have been the case. Okay, because how, how else would they readily know? All right, so anyway, they bring the woman to Jesus, you remember. Uh, but, but you always have to wonder, how were they Johnnies on the spot like this? And they're doing the exact same thing that Jesus condemns here in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. Okay? They are not noticing their own sins, but they're very eager to point out hers. Not only that, but they're willing, you notice, to be judges, jurists, and executioners. All at all in the same all at the same time. They're perfectly willing to do that. And something else I noticed when going over this story from John again. Maybe you've picked up on this before. I think before arriving, now unless, unless you could say the streets of Jerusalem were littered with stones the size big enough for a stoning, and I don't think they were, notice that they very likely picked up stones and brought them with them. So this is premeditation to me that they bring their stones with them to this party that they create by making this big scene as Jesus is trying to teach in the public square. And they interrupt him, of course, with a test for him to see how, he's, how is he going to respond to this. This is an obvious case. Open and shut. She's guilty. What's he going to do about it? That's what they're thinking. And... Jesus, reason I think they may have the rocks in hand, Jesus says this, he who's without sin, throw the first rock. Remember? Why would he say that if they didn't already have the stones either close at hand or in hand? He's basically saying, if you can judge this woman without anything needing judging in your own life, then your rocks are cleared for takeoff. Let them fly. Okay? And, of course, what happens? From the wisest to the most brash, oldest to the youngest, they slowly walk away and, and probably drop the rocks as they go because they understand. They're confronted with the truth. We've all got stuff going on for which we need to be judged. We, we can't and we shouldn't be here and be throwing these accusations hypocritically against this woman. And Jesus, how does he respond? Does he let the woman uh, off the hook? No. He judges her, but not without mercy. He doesn't condemn her, but neither does he condone her lifestyle, because it's very plain what he says to her. She is violating God's will for her life. And so he says, go, but leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more, depending on your translation. So the point of this first part is, judge hypocritically, without thought to her own sins, we cannot do that because we're subject to the same thing. 
That does not, however, that does not mean that as Christians we can't judge in all the different senses that that, as that term is used today. And in fact, we are commissioned to judge in several different ways. The key is understanding this concept. We're to judge correctly, righteously. Now just quickly think with me about why the world wants us to believe the lie Christians shouldn't judge. Two reasons, really, at least two, as I think of it. The first involves the word that we're all very tired of. I, I, I bring it up a lot because it's, it's brought up a lot in the world. It's this word tolerance. In the ever-loving name of tolerance, you can't be seen judging anyone nowadays because that just seemed to be arrogant and bigoted to say that Folks don't have the right. Everyone has the right to be left alone and do what they believe or want to do uh, as they please, no matter what they believe or do or say or who it might affect or hurt. That everyone has that right. That's the idea of tolerance, or that's the meaning of tolerance today. Everything goes. You can't tell me. I can't tell you. The second reason that all forms of judging are condemned today is really the foundation of the first one, which is today, truth and morality are all completely relative. Those in the world who say this want you to acknowledge there are no universal, absolute truths that anyone has to obey, and so now, evidently, we're all living in a no-judging zone. Did you know that? You probably, you probably can tell that by now, right? We, we live, supposedly, in a no-judging, no-judgment zone. I love what Larry Osborne says in response to this in his book, Ten, and this is part of where I got the idea for this series, Ten Dumb Things Smart Christians Believe. That's the title of his book, and I, I put that picture up lately. This is direct quote here. Now think about this. Imagine an engineering student arguing that his calculations really don't matter as long as they work for him. Now, you engineers, think about that. Is that true? Not many of us would drive over a bridge. This is the quote here. Not many of us would drive over a bridge that he designed. And I agree with that. I would not want to be, go anywhere near a bridge that this guy designed. Well, the, well like, they came out okay for me. And he adds to that, he says, or imagine a doctor giving you a handful of pills and telling you to take whichever ones feel right. Really? Try that on for your next medical advice and see how that works for you. Every one of us knows, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, every one of us in the world knows we live by objective standards every day. Everything can't be right. If everything's right, nothing is. We live by standards every day. There are laws we have to pay attention to every day that are absolutes. We can't live without them. And so to say that we can't make value judgments and use discernment based on a standard is ridiculous. Jesus has told us what the standard is to be for us as Christians. He said it's His Word. It is Scripture. That's the mark by which men will one day be judged. He said there's a Word by which all men will be judged one day. He said it's by my Word. So having standards is, is a non-issue. We all have them. The question is, by whose standards will we judge? For us, it's not our own idea of what's right or wrong, and certainly not our far from perfect practice of righteousness that's to be the measuring stick for others. It is God's Word. It is God's truth. And you better believe we are able, in fact, we are commanded to hold His truths up as a standard by which we evaluate everything and everyone else around us. 
How are we measuring up to what He says, His absolutes? Okay, I'm in the home stretch here, but we can't finish without looking at why we can and should judge in the sense of making evaluations of folks based on the fruit we see in their lives. Again, holding up what we see in them in comparison with God's truths. First of all, in regards to the precious truths of the gospel, Jesus said some just are not going to appreciate it. And so he said we should not waste our time and efforts on these. That's the point of 7 verse 6. Okay? And isn't it precious? Someone's, someone's pet porker is crimping and preening there. Uh, this is a different translation to me, but give that which is, do not give that which is holy, or give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither uh, shall you put pearls before swine, or throw pearls before swine. That, uh, that scripture is pretty self-explanatory. Dogs were unholy creatures to the Jews. So Jesus is saying, don't, don't throw away what's important. Don't just treat as, as common what is precious to God, the gospel. Don't waste time on those who aren't interested. One of my professors, who was a long-time career missionary at Abilene called it the harvest principle and maybe you've heard of that by another name but the harvest principle is important for all of us to remember and it's simply this you spend your time where the most kingdom good will be done with those folks who are the most receptive the most eager the most hungering and thirsting for what God has for them to know and learn and do rather than on those who seem resistant to the Word at worst and just not interested in it or in God's will at best. They're just, eh, okay. Many feel they're doing fine all by themselves and they don't need God. We know a lot of these folks as well. Again, they're using a standard when they say this, aren't they? And they themselves are judging. What they're doing is they're using their friends, their neighbors, their co-workers, people with whom they deal in their day-to-day -day life, they're holding them up as a standard and saying, well, as opposed to my neighbor who's been convicted several times, I'm doing great. Or, you know, as opposed to this saintly neighbor I have over here, this neighbor lady, I'm, I'm not doing that bad. In other words, they're not holding up the right standard. And I guarantee you that those comparisons and that standard by which they're making those comparisons, it's not going to work on the day of judgment. We're not going to be pleasing God by saying, well, I was better than the next guy. I was better than my neighbor over here. You have to give me that. Jesus spoke about this being judicious, being uh, discerning, with his disciples, not just in our Matthew 7 passage from today, but in those times when he sent them out on what we call the limited commission, when they were sent out two by two, you remember, to preach and to heal and so forth. Um, this is in, uh, and this is not on the screen, but this is in Matthew 10, uh, beginning in verse 11. I'll read you a few verses here on his instructions as he sent them out. He says, whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person. What's he saying right there? That's a judgment, isn't it? Search out for some worthy person, he says, um, and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, guess what? There's another judgment. If the house is deserving... You've got, to, you've got to figure this out. You've got to use discernment. You've got to use wisdom. But you're making a value judgment. If they're worthy, 
let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it would be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Now, uh, one more. I'll, I'll finish this passage. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. He says, you gotta, you got to look at people and what what they produce in their lives. you got to look at their attitudes that come out when you talk to them. Are they approachable? Are they teachable? Or are they, are they closed up? Or are they not wanting to hear? If they're not wanting to hear, then that, that's the harvest principle, right? If they're not wanting to hear, then don't throw your pearls in front of them. Don't, don't cast the treasure of the gospel away on them because that's wasting precious resources. Just, just move on. Move on if they're not interested. In every way, Jesus' men were to evaluate and use wise discernment to figure out who they could entrust to help them, where to best find receptivity for the word. One last thing here. We've got to make value judgments because some people's souls are dependent on it. Some people's souls are dependent on it. You remember that old song, we don't sing it much anymore. And so especially younger people probably don't know it, but it was called, or it had this line in it, you never mention him to me. And the premise of the song is of someone, and it's fictional because this will never happen anyway, but it's of someone who's lost one day asking a Christian after the fact, you knew I wasn't living right. Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you warn me? That's the premise of the song. It is a convicting thought, isn't it? It's a sobering thought. What about a Christian who's caught in sin and needs to be shown that they're missing the standard that God has set? They're missing the mark. What, what if we don't tell them in time for them to turn that around? Just because we hear this expression, well, Christians shouldn't judge, and we take it to heart, and in the spirit of being what folks around us call tolerant, or, you know, saying, well, we're going to give grace this time, we don't do anything, or we don't say anything. When we know someone needs someone to point out truth, What's God going to say about that? God's going to say, that's not an act of grace. That's disobedience. If you know someone in the Lord, especially someone in the Lord, who's not living up to God's standards for their lives, you owe it to them to lovingly point it out. You have to tell them. Now, notice I said in the Lord. We cannot judge non-Christians, those outside of Christ, by the same standards as if they were in Christ. We can't do that. But I'm talking about fellow Christians. We can evaluate. We can make value judgments based on what's coming out of their lives. By their fruit, you'll recognize what's going on. James says this about this particular act of discernment with fellow Christians in James chapter 5. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings it back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. Let me urge you with this, and the lesson's yours. Don't buy into the downright misleading and useless expression, well, Christians shouldn't judge. Don't buy into that. Don't listen to that. Treat it for the false claim that it is. Understand that while we're not in the place of God, we have to certainly watch against hypocrisy, yet we have to make the best use of the gospel with 
with the hearts that are responsive to it, not resistant. And we, while we can't judge anyone's hearts, that's God's job alone, we can evaluate people by the things that we see in their lives. And we're commanded to do that. We have to do that. Their souls, and maybe ours, might be dependent on. They just might both be dependent on. We'll look at another. Next week, we'll look at a lie that's told about God. But for now, the lesson is use the wisdom that God's given us through His Word. Understand the standard of evaluating anyone is not, is not us, is not them. It is God's Word. And understand we all need to be measured against His truth and by the products of what's going on or what comes out of our life. There's something amiss in your life. You need to turn over, further over to God. We can help you as family. With the Make that known. Don't stand. Don't stand. Lord, make us
is where this happens for a while on a regular basis. We have another uh, Christian to whom uh, who has decided to come and work and worship with our church family and uh, to whom I want to introduce you today uh, over here to my right in this wing, Trish or Trisha Wisenhunt. If I can get her to stand and be recognized. Welcome, Trish. Mm. Uh, to folks who have been plugged in and through the years with the Belton Church family, uh, Trisha was there at, at one point. And this is back a little way, and I know it's back a ways because uh, she was telling me the other night uh, as she remet the Richies in here in this room that uh, on Wednesday night that uh, Alan Ritchie, the Ritchie's son, uh, was her kid's youth minister, at least for a couple of them. So that goes back a little ways. Uh, because Alan has been preaching in uh, Lake Jackson for quite a while now. so uh, But we welcome her. You may see her uh, around at Brookshire Brothers. That's where m some of you may know her. She's got the tag saying Trish on there. And so uh, anyway, several of you know her through diff uh, several different places. But we welcome her today uh, to be a part of our church family and uh, to work and worship here. God, we thank you for... Uh, continuing to bring those to us who, who find a, a family that seems like home to them and is welcoming to them and a place where they can plug in and be in a uh, active um, uh, in community, in a community of faith as we have here in this, in this uh, body of believers here in Salado. And we are thankful for Trish and you bringing her our way and that uh, we pray we can be an encouragement and help to her in, in any way that we can, and we pray that she will be an encouragement to us as well. And uh, as we work together to strive to be, as a people as a whole, uh, the people you want us to be. May we always help each other to do that very thing. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I, too, sense some measure of excitement around here. And it was about that this morning that I wanted to talk just briefly. We, we have a song in our book, uh, and we emphasize the aspect of it that I intended to talk about, and that is to revive us. Uh, I sense that we are in the midst of revival. Do you? Something tells me there's more things going on right now than we're accustomed to uh, thinking are, are normal. Um, and I think we're in the, in the very uh, midst of uh, a revival. And I want to invite you to pray with me this morning, and I want to encourage you uh, to pray that God will bless us in revival. This song is in the book it surprised me to find that it was not in the revive us again category, but so much it was the praise God, praise. And I want to I want to read the words of the song, which kind of focuses on what I'm trying to 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 talk about a little bit. The song says, and this is one familiar to most of you, uh, we praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love. For Jesus who died and is now gone above. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Familiar, to me, familiar words that I've not given serious thought to, but the idea of revival appeals to me just now. We've been through some difficult times, and some of you have suffered more to, to uh, respond to that than, than I can even uh, know. 
but it's been difficult for a lot of folks for a long time now, but we're kind of coming out of it. And as far as this church is concerned, we're enjoying, I think, a feeling that we're in the midst of something changing. And hopefully it is changing and much for the better. And we appreciate those who are visiting with us. We appreciate those who decided to remain with us and become a part of this family. And we continually invite you to do that. Hopefully you find with us here a feeling of family that we expect to maintain and, and continue throughout. Uh, but pray for revival, if you will, that we might enjoy a great excitement. And even as I think about these things, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm recalling uh, what the church experienced in the early days after the day of Pentecost. Those people were excited. I encourage you to help us all get to, to that point of being excited in what's going on here. Praise God. It is a praising of our Savior, our Father. It's nothing that we're doing that we're not supposed to do. But let's enjoy this and let's find the excitement. Uh, let's encourage and even pray that we might enjoy a great revival here. Would you pray with me now? Father, we're thankful this morning for many things. You've blessed us continually for a long time. You've blessed this church, Father, with a spirit of unity and peace. You've blessed this church with a spirit of some excitement that we are members of your family, that we are members together, that together we're stronger than if we were standing alone. Father, you've blessed us continually and we pray that you would continue, that you would keep us mindful of these things that you do for us, that you remind us daily as we reflect on where we are and where we're headed, that you remind us, Father, that you've provided us this way. We pray, Father, that you would bless this church with a sense of revival, that we might return, that we might renew the excitement that once was here. We pray that you would cause us to come alive again that we might share the message that we have and, and proclaim with those who do not have it. That we might reach out to touch those and make a difference in the lives of those yet to come. Bless us, Father, that we may each of us become a part of this, this revival. Keep us mindful of your presence and your power throughout. We praise you and give you thanks for all these things. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be standing.